I normally get up and head straight to the coffee pot. If I don't have my coffee, I don't think I'd be able to function. I chose Ferris because when I toured here, it felt like home. I was like, yeah, this is, this is where I want to be. It's a lot of work, yes, but it'll be worth it. So today was a good day. It started off super early for me because me and the EIC went um, to do distribution in the buildings, the bigger buildings of, at Ferris. Yeah, I'm always excited for these meetings. This entire section needs to be filled and sent to the Pioneer by the end of today. One time they saw me and uh, they kind of questioned me about that. I'm like, oh, that's weird that he walks like me. It's exciting because this is what I signed up for. I did this. Big Rapids, Michigan. Defined by the rushing rapids of the Muskegon River, which runs through it. The town got its start with the lumber trade, but now is best known as the home of Ferris State University. For 140 years, this space, now nearly 1,000 acres, has facilitated the instruction of generations of successful students. This living legacy began in 1884, when Helen and Woodbridge Ferris founded the Big Rapids Industrial School in a meager room in a downtown building. This school was founded with the principle that education should be for all children, all men and all women, all the time. Woodridge developed this philosophy as a young man, where his evenings were spent listening to great speeches with his father, speeches given by American greats like Frederick Douglass. His father or his grandfather took him to hear Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist. I think it had a great impact on him. Mr. Ferris early on heard people who were way ahead of their time in terms of rights for women, rights for African Americans, rights for immigrants and others. Ferris's thirst for education led him to be a teacher and principal of his hometown school in Spencer, New York. Here, he would marry his first wife, Helen Gillespie, who similarly shared a passion for education. She was very much his partner. He treated her as an equal partner. I think she was an equal partner. She really wanted to support and see success and look at things in new ways, create opportunities for those who had not had those opportunities previously. I think she was an activist and a mentor. They decided they were going to be teachers together and they got the opportunity to come up here where they could actually be in charge of their own school. They found that perfect place in Macosta County roughly 60 miles north of the bustling city of Grand Rapids. The town of Big Rapids, formerly known as Leonard, was founded just 30 years before the Ferrises had arrived. There wasn't a whole lot for industry. It was just sort of a, a, a spot on the map. It really didn't start growing until Woodbridge Ferris came here. I think what Ferris found in Big Rapids is what is happening right now. A lot of really good, hardworking people that um, want to better themselves. The Ferris family chose Big Rapids, Michigan, in hopes of attracting lumberjacks and farmers and anyone who lacked access to education. You think about that history, and you think about his desire to provide an opportunity for anyone, 
regardless of the color of your skin, regardless of your gender, he was focused on anyone and everyone having an opportunity. That to me still speaks loudly here almost 140 years later. Women were a part of the very first class, which is incredibly unusual for women to have a professional degree was, you know, I mean, they were way ahead of their times to see women as equal citizens to men. They would use donations back from people's salaries in order to be offering more scholarships so that more students who couldn't afford it could come for these programs. There were two girls who they gave free tuition to because there were only two teachers at that point. There was Woodridge and his wife, Helen. The first semester only had 15 students enrolled in common English and bookkeeping. But steadily, the Big Rapids Industrial School grew and eventually built their first facility, becoming the Ferris Institute. You had the ginormous building that they had built there, a very large building where most of the classrooms were. The first floor was provisioned for chemistry and pharmacy. The second floor was equipped for biology, literature, and drawing. The third floor was for shorthand and typewriting. The Ferris Institute was truly a success at this point in 1901. The college prep program, they would set you up and they'd say, okay, you need to have a skill set in here. Can you teach math? Can you teach history? Can you teach penmanship? The program was incredibly unique for its time, and it drew people to Ferris from across the nation. But one important connection was the Hampton Institute, a historically black university. And we found 60 or 70 African Americans who came up from Hampton, Virginia. Apparently there was an agreement between Mr. Ferris and uh, Hampton Institute. We kind of have an idea that um, because Booker T. Washington came here to speak in 1902 and Booker T. Washington was a Hampton grad and he started the Tuskegee Institute. So the fact that Booker T. Washington and Mr. Ferris had this kind of collegial relationship um, kind of indicates that that's how the Hampton Institute and the Ferris Institute kind of got this connection together. The Ferris mission to educate those who had never had access was truly unique. The Ferris Institute paved the path of education while Jim Crow segregation laws were enforced in the South. The Hampton Institute recognized college at Ferris was different. There was opportunity for change here. Came up here, they were well taken care of. As far as we could discover, just really changed this nation. Belford Lawson was the first African American to win a case before the United States Supreme Court. It was at Ferris that he was inspired to study law. And so he wrote back a letter to the Hampton Institute and said that they're doing great here. Mr. Ferris is very inspiring. And he said, you know, I think I have discovered the way that I can make the world better. And that is by studying law. Percival Prattis, who was the first African American to be in the press galleries of Congress in 1947. You know, he actually, you know, had an impact in the Grand Rapids area. Prattis was part of creating the first uh, African American newspaper there. So when he was at the Chicago Defender, a historically black newspaper, it was one of the leading newspapers in the country. And he became a voice for many black Americans. The people were freer to to criticize Jim Crow, to advocate to African Americans to leave the South, to talk about political issues and stuff. And he was, he was at the forefront of, of that. All of these great Ferris students are woven into the history of the American experience. Woodbridge himself would also touch America on a larger scale. In 1913, he won the governorship of Michigan and served two terms. In 1922, Ferris won the election to the United States Senate. His winning edge was the mass of students who had graduated from his school, those who owed the fruits of their education to the efforts of this aged idealist. Through it all, Ferris would remain president of the Ferris Institute until his death in 1928. His legacy of equality stands as a core tenant of Ferris, even today, 140 years later. I'm the 19th person who has been in this position. 
as number 19, when I go back to number one and look at him, that is the standard that I need to try to emulate. Mr. Ferris had this character of, of boldness and of courage. Those years under our founder set a foundation for us. When we treat people with respect, irrespective of their race or ethnicity or any other variable, we honor his legacy. Five fifteen p.m. The last day of the term. Thirteen degrees in the middle of winter. Icy, impassable conditions. The worst circumstances for an emergency, and yet, fire crews, students, and the Big Rapids community rushed to the scene of a fire that was starting in Ferris's old main building. When I first heard the alarm and then looked to see what was going on, there was a little bit of flame that was coming out of the roof. There was snow all over the ground. They couldn't get the water pressure out of the fire hoses. So even though there initially started out to be one concentrated fire, then it was a really big fire. And then the fire caught fire to the uh, pharmacy building. By that time, most of the roof was on fire, never seen anything like that. Particularly in the case of the pharmacy building, they didn't know what was going to catch on fire. They had a lot of chemicals up there. The blistering cold and age of the buildings added to the difficulty of quelling the blaze. My mother was a telephone operator and she ran over there in her pajamas and started, you know, um, answering all the phone calls because it, it was just devastating. 73 years later, the cause of the fire is still a mystery, but speculations flew around. Fingers pointed towards students and equipment. Someone said it was a Bunsen burner that was left on. It could have been someone smoking in the basement area where the bathrooms were. There was a lot of emotion. In this case, I mean, a lot of, a lot of people, if they weren't actually fighting the fire, uh, had connection with Ferris because they'd probably attended. People were evacuated from the blistering buildings and educational equipment was rescued from the snowy ruins. That's the equipment that the students were literally throwing out the window down to someone who caught it so they'd have something to use for their next class, wherever they were going to be, even though the building was gone. They did have a whole bunch of people there who came running out and they didn't really have trampolines, but they would use tarps and they would catch people. Ferris president, Byron Brophy, led the evacuation of Old Main. Witnesses report that Brophy even used his own prosthetic leg to break down doors and to help rescue those trapped inside. And Brophy was pretty close to the last one out of the building. From the time they uh, had the alarm till what they considered they had the fire under control, it wasn't all that long, it was just a few hours. The fire department brought the flames to a stalemate, but it smoldered during the night. Families, students, teachers were all heartbroken. The home of their education and vibrant community decimated. As the sun rose over campus, the remnants of Ferris Institute were reduced to the alumni building and a few small structures. And yet, hope remained. There's this big pasteboard sign up front with chalk on it and says, we will go on. Well, it's kind of it's the bulldog spirit, I guess you would call it. Helen and Woodbridge Ferris's dream could not be extinguished. And at the time, after the fire, there was a huge outpouring of support from alumni. 
the vision of Michigan's 28th governor needed to be revitalized. And they said, this is not in any way the end of Ferris, and that this came out and the governor came and he goes, no, we're, we are going to rebuild, we're going to help you. Something that was such a incredibly horrific and tragic thing also served as a catalyst for us to say, how do we not only rebuild, how do we rebuild ourselves? It has what I call a phoenix effect uh, out of the ashes that you rise. I'm gonna be like, oh my God, like I don't have to go to school and it's gonna be really weird. I don't have to move back into Ferris. I don't have to drive to Big Rapids. So it's gonna be that whole thing. When I first started at Ferris, I was like, maybe journalism isn't for me. And then it was mainly the torch that got me into everything. So this is the last one? Yep. How's it feel? Um, it doesn't feel like anything yet. I don't know when it's gonna kick in. As journalism and technical education senior, Juliana Di Nicolo makes her last delivery of the Ferris State Torch, she continues the paper's 128-year goal of keeping students informed. Before it was known as The Torch, students knew it as The Literary Voice. Then it became Ferris Institute News, then Ferris Weekly, until in 1938, the name stuck. A big part of what we do is to teach the basics of news writing, of editing, of reporting, of interviewing, and The Torch is the perfect tool to put that into practice. I love the torch. When I first started, it was just something I was doing for school. And then um, I've seen myself grow as a person, a student and a journalist. And she's grown so much in her confidence, her trust in herself and her ability to write clearly and effectively and report so well and to manage people. So she went from, you know, the bottom to the top. And in that time, I have seen more growth in her than probably any journalist that I've ever had. I'm now like focusing harder on the things that I think matter the most, which is like the torch for me and my classes and doing well in those and learning and all that. You do a lot and you have to care a lot and you have to want to learn a lot in order for it to work. It, it's a lot of work, but it just pays off so much in the end. While the student owned and run Ferris State Torch continues to adapt to changing trends in media distribution, Stack hopes one thing never changes. Their goal is to speak truth to power. And when you can inhabit that, that means doing so even if it's uncomfortable, like within the campus community, we will always have the need of a free and independent press. The relentless reporting of Torch journalists was especially important in the 1960s. A decade and a half after fire tore through campus, the flames of change would sweep the nation. The civil rights movement would soon transform the Ferris campus, but in a small town like Big Rapids, not everyone was open to change. And then what we have is something amazingly bad happened. We just got away from that legacy to the point where when you get to the 1960s, you have race riots on campus. There was a schism between the white and the black students, mainly because the, the students of color came from urban areas and a lot of the other students came from rural areas. So they really hadn't interacted, didn't know much about each other, just what they've been told. During this time, Black Ferris students dealt with overt racism while studying at Ferris. Ku Klux Klan posters were hung in dormitories, along with Confederate flags. The Black student population, including Ron Sneed, felt that the administration did little to improve the campus climate. The Black students finally had enough when an article circulated campus titled Bay of Pigs, which criticized Black students and compared them to pigs. We lost our first sight on who we should have been. And, and it's unfortunate there, that there were some incidents that happened. There were some, uh, I guess, riots or, or fighting on campus. And 
because of race. It's a sore spot on, on our on our history, but it's the truth. And, and, and so I don't think we should hide from it. I think we should learn from it. The Pacal Dormitory was the center of the violent confrontation. Black students were refused access to the dorm when trying to discuss issues with a fraternity brother. The student came back 100 strong and began breaking windows. The white students responded with just as many numbers as they paraded down the streets, destroying property. There were Molotov cocktails and I actually had a frat brother if you can imagine, he pulled a stop sign out of the ground. It was breaking windshields and stuff of that nature. And I took a couple kids who had glass cuts to the health center back then, and um, they wouldn't take the kids because they said it was, it was a riot. The confrontation lasted three hours and grew to around 200 participants. Eventually, 50 police officers dispersed the crowds and arrested 13 people including Ron Sneed, who was just there to help calm the rising tension. I wasn't afraid of anything, but I was just uh, concerned that somebody was going to get hurt. The campus suffered $5,000 in damages, which equates to around $43,000 in today's terms, and around 30 cars were damaged. Two were actually totaled. My car got turned over and totaled. So they, they arrested us all, if you can imagine, took us all around, all in buses. They couldn't keep us in jail, there was too many of us, so they put us in the armory. For Sneed, this was the last straw. And after being released, he decided that he was leaving Ferris for good. He told a local newspaper, quote, the whites can have this school. I was exonerated, although I spent the night in jail. I was gonna leave. You know, I just was trying to get my degree. So when the police came and I got arrested, President Spadhell came down to jail and wanted to know I was there, and I explained to him that I was called to help break it up. President Victor Spadhelf wouldn't just let Sneed walk away. He believed that Sneed could be the one to help bridge the rift. But I just became closer to the university as a, not just a student, but someone realized the importance of being here. And so that's, that's why I've stayed. Sneed stayed because he thought that Ferris had promise. But he also recognized that the administration was still not responsive enough. So he decided to run for student government president. However, Sneed lost by just a slim majority, but he did become vice president instead and hoped that this role would help lead to improving race relations at Ferris. Understand there were no people of color in staff or faculty. So there was no one that could understand what you, you were going through up here. To help unite the college, both black and white students from across campus came together and handed out thousands of ribbons in a campaign for peace. We were trying to come up with a phrase, and that's how we came up. Let's start living and working together now. And then we had a, uh, a rally at, at Top Taggart Field to discuss, you know, what do we do to, to, to make this work? And then the administration started, started hiring people color, not a lot, but some, but the, the administration made a concerted effort to try to make things better. Ultimately, they succeeded in improving the rights of black students on campus and made great strides in improving diversity within the college. Students, staff, administrators, and community members all work together to bridge this entrenched divide. It offers a reminder that this fight isn't over and there's always more work to do. History is helpful for us to be educated, for us to be aware, but also for us to make sure we do not repeat some of the mistakes of the past. Today, Ron Sneed is a two-term member of the Ferris Board of Trustees, and he's still actively engaged in many areas of the Ferris community. And he still thinks the future of Ferris is bright. I'm excited about this, this new generation of students because they're more accepting than than the society was when I was a student here. And Ron's commitment to furthering the Ferris legacy continues more than 50 years later as the fourth generation of the Sneed family prepares for graduation. I've always believed I had a place here and with my grandpa's legacy here, I always knew I had some big shoes to fill. And so when I came here, I warned him, I said, I hope I can do it. He's my hero. 
I always remember he said he said he thought about transferring and I looked at him, I said our entire family heritage would have been different if you would have left this place and I'm thankful he didn't. Five decades after those troubling times on campus, the Jim Crow Museum continues its mission to teach tolerance with items of intolerance, using the nation's largest collection from that era of America's hateful history. So the Jim Crow Museum grew out of my personal collection. It's a long story. Why would a young person start collecting these things? Um, it was part of my journey. I bought a, what I believe to have been like a, a little a uh, mammy salt and pepper shaker, uh, and I broke it. Not because I was trying to be philosophical, but I just didn't like it. I don't remember the second piece, or the third piece, or the fourth piece. I just remember always collecting. I went to a historically black college, Jarvis Christian College, where in general I learned that objects could be used as teaching tools. By the time I got to Ferris in 1990, I had over 3,000 pieces. I donated them to the institution with the understanding that uh, they would be preserved and displayed. In the mid-90s, the first home for the Jim Crow Museum was just a small room on the third floor of the Star Building. I'm quoted as saying, the Jim Crow Museum would never be open to the public. That it'll always be by appointment only, because I was so concerned that people wouldn't get it. Obviously, that's not the approach today. One of the students wrote this poem about this object. My mouth is open, kiss me. Hold my old and splintered lips and close them. I am poor, so pay me. But your rancid copper pennies taste bloody on my tongue. My eyes are staring, wake me. Scrape away the darkened paint that shackles me to anger. My mouth is open, feed me. Free me from the game you play. I've given all I have away. That was actually written by a high school student. Today, the museum houses more than 20,000 items. And the museum's message can be seen across Michigan with the traveling exhibit titled, Overcoming Hateful Things. It's a teaching tool in hopes of people understanding uh, what different factions of, of our country have, have lived through. The future hope of the Jim Crow Museum would be to expand into its own building at the front of campus. Its mission is to display a more comprehensive and inclusive retelling of a complex and potent period in our culture. We need to tell a bigger story about what it is we need to do as individuals, as communities, and as a nation. Now he's known as Brutus, the lovable yet feisty mascot for the Ferris Bulldogs. But Ferris didn't always have such a memorable animal to get students inspired to root on the home team. First, Ferris was known as the Spartans. Then the Big Rapids pioneer referred to us as Ferrisites. And you can imagine how that went over. Ferrisites sounds a lot like parasites, so it wasn't um, well perceived. But during the 1930-31 basketball season, pioneer sports columnist Lester Williams used that memorable nickname for the first time. They got to a packed stadium. Ferris is hanging in there, they're fighting. One of the newspaper writers said, your team played just like bulldogs, didn't they? He said that we fought to the very end, we were tenacious, we didn't give up, just like true Bulldogs. But it took years for the Bulldogs to finally gain a recognizable mascot. That was until Ferris student Jim Wilzak approached athletic director Dean Davenport about the possibilities of filling those shoes. And he said, how about a mascot? I mean, I'd just like to be a Bulldog. The process of building the costume took many twists and turns. It had to be recognizable and comfortable, but they still struggled to solve one really important issue. But it was very hot to wear, because I wore it once. 
and I got a lot of respect for everybody who's been the Bulldog over the years because I, I've been in that uniform once. My dad talked me into being the Bulldog and after about uh, two and a half hours of walking down Main Street in that Bulldog costume, I think I lost about 10 pounds. On November 9th, 1979, Ferris hockey fans finally met the legend. So it was fun to kind of see him when he first showed up and it was almost like instantaneous adoption of, well, of course we should have somebody in a bulldog costume <laughs> at all the games. And it's just turned into like an, this institution. While a mascot continued to inspire the crowds, Dean Davenport also decided a rebranding of the bulldog logo was needed. I inherited a bulldog and it was a bulldog that had his tongue out the side of his mouth and he looked like he's gonna love you to death. And I said, the first thing I'm gonna do is make a feisty fighting bulldog. Since Dean's son, Terry, was a talented artist and enrolled at Ferris in commercial art, he seemed like the perfect fit to revitalize the logo. We started just looking at what are the bulldog logos out there, both for inspiration, but also making sure that whatever we ended up with was uniquely Ferris's bulldog. And a lot of the other Bulldog logos, you know, they're not kind of in fighting mode. And after the research, the challenge of forming this iconic logo took on hundreds of iterations. You know, the artist process is like you draw one and then you take a sheet of tracing paper and you change the things you don't like and then you take another sheet of tracing paper and you keep, you're just kind of trying things and you're noodling and you're layering and you're layering. And I couldn't figure out how to make the Bulldog look like a fighting bulldog because in reality, bulldogs have really little mouth and really little teeth and they're not all that ferocious. And so I got some photograph and some images of lions roaring. Like what would a lion look like when it was like full roar? And I took some, I kind of cheated and took a little bit of that muscular feel of, of what a big mouth, ferocious mouth would look like and I put it on a bulldog. It didn't work at first, but then, you know, I kind of made it a little smaller and moved this over here. And after about three layers of tissue paper, finally I'm like, hmm, that might work. <laughs> you can tell from the ears, suddenly when the ears perk up, that's a sense of attention and energy. And then we started playing around with the collar and, you know, putting the spike collar on him, of course, added one more level of toughness. And you can see the sequence as he got closer and closer to the final product until boom, there it is. And he put that F on there, with, on the collar. And the only one F and that's Ferris. I did another logo, this little coffee company in Seattle called Starbucks. It was its 40th anniversary. And we wondered if Starbucks had gotten to the point where it was iconic. And so we experimented with, can the mermaid, the siren stand alone and everybody recognize her at Starbucks and uh, we decided to kind of make the leap uh, and it worked. So one of the things when I look at the Bulldog logo today, the designer in me would say, well, maybe it could be cleaned up and simplified a little bit. But I think if you did that, I think it would lose some of the personality that kind of makes it so successful today. So I would say pencils down. <laughs> the Bulldog logo became so beloved. In 2013, it went head to head in a Detroit Free Press poll with other famous logos in Michigan. Pretty soon we're in the final four. And, and I called Terry in Seattle. I said, Terry, our run is done. We're playing the Tigers now, and I don't think we're going to beat the English D. And when I heard, I think uh, the Bulldog beat, who was it, the Detroit Tigers? I think for the number one spot by tens of thousands of votes. I was very humbled and proud and excited by that. I think it was a big moment for fair sports. Ever since I started coming here, I wanted to be Brutus. He's the face of the university and his job is to entertain everybody and keep everybody engaged. Oh, well done! It changed my fear of failing, um, and it taught me just to do your best, um, go all in, and be passionate about things. It takes a lot to keep the secret of who's under the mask, and there have been a few close calls. He would sweat all, 
It had to be washed after every game. I washed it, I took it home, and my wife and I, between the two of us, washed and dried it. And somehow, when I walked through the lobby, either the tail or the ear of the bulldog was out. We had a student that came to every game, and I walked by him and, and say, hi, Richard, and he said, you're the bulldog. And I said, no, no, I'm just taking the bulldog's uniform. He's the bulldog, everybody. And everybody stops and comes around, and they're, they're all trying to tell Richard, no, he's not. He's the athletic director. He's not the bulldog. Yeah, it's very hard to keep that secret. I was doing a thing for uh, Valentine's Day, and I ran into a bunch of my friends for that. It was really hard to not say something to them, like, hey, I saw you yesterday. Like, no, you didn't. <laughs> but eventually, the mask must come off and the Ferris community always celebrates that moment. I'm more nervous than when I did my audition. <laughs> Fans, do you want to know who the Bulldog is? Your 2022-23 Ferris State Bulldog, Cody Langloy. It becomes part of them and they know they're a part of something even greater, and it's meaningful. It feels bittersweet. It's pretty cool. The student was brought to tears. Most of them are when they pull off that mask for the last time because they're leaving a little bit of their heart in that suit. It makes me want to tear up because it is a special moment for them. In the suit, I've had countless amazing memories that I'll never forget. Um, being everybody's favorite dog, like it's it's amazing. Brutus will likely continue to inspire Ferris fans for another 140 years, and Dean and Terry's part in that legacy will also be seen around campus for oh, years to come. Good job. <laughs> <laughs>17 varsity teams now compete at Ferris. Ferris State University's athletic teams inspire the university community and are nationally renowned for their successes. But it took some time for Ferris Institute to incorporate athletics into the school. In fact, Woodbridge thought football specifically was just horseplay. But athletics would get its foothold in the 1890s. Here's a look at the 1906 varsity football team. And in 1908, two Ferris basketball teams were formed, then baseball, then tennis, and track. In 1911, the first Ferris women's basketball team competed on Saturday afternoons. We as an institution started you know, women's sports before it was really mandated by Title IX. Um, I think we were you know, forward thinking in that. In 2024, there are just over 400 student athletes who have chosen to learn and play on campus. I do find Fair State to be a very welcoming place. You know, when I got here, it was nothing but open arms for my coaches. Players just welcomed me in the moment they met me and just treating me like a player, honestly. Like everyone says, oh, you're a part of the team. Like, don't let anyone take that from you. Ferris has improved my life by a ton. The opportunities that you get here is unmatched, and especially being a student athlete, it just really builds your character. I feel that we've got a lot of uh, 
returning veteran. Bob Daniels has served as Ferris's Division I hockey coach since 1992. He is also the winningest coach in Ferris State's history. I play free and force is a mission of opportunity um, by really having a diverse group of people that we recruit here. We all meld together, if you will, not only within the hockey team, but within the athletic department as a whole. He's won a championship. He's gotten to the final ice four. He's a wonderful man. He's a great person. The guys before me, seeing all the, all the grind and, and sacrifice and just to selfless act to contribute to this program being great is expiring and I having conversations when I transferred in with those older players helped me establish what I wanted to do during my time here. Sports, like education, plays an essential role in the legacy of opportunity here at Ferris State University. The institution helps instill the value of staying active both mentally and physically. Well, at our level, well, you have to be a, a student athlete and uh, you know get an education, and that's what's going to take you far in life. You come here because you want to accomplish something, you want to become something, and you're willing to work for it. So being able to see them start in the beginning, see them progress, get better, mature on and off the field, in inside and outside of competition, to get to where they're going to be, to get to their next level, that's what's really special. Having my mom in my corner, like knowing if I was screwing around in school, that would make her upset. Uh, that, that kept that in the back of my head, and it's why I was attacking the classroom hard. LeRae was ranked top 35 defensive ends in the nation, and his hard work in the classroom paid off as he was named to the 2022 and 2023 Academic All-America team. What a lot of the fans don't always know is how great he was as a student. He truly was a great student athlete, and those are the kind of stories that you really love to see. I chose Ferris because of the culture here. They have an amazing education program, and I really liked the basketball side of things as well. Fourth year education major and All-American honoree, Chloe Idoni's successes on the court require hours of work in the classroom. As a student teacher, she's helping provide learning opportunities to a new generation of students. I'm a great, a sour great. Sure. But it all takes focus and hours of dedication each week. You know, it, I obviously have to take it really seriously because we're held to a high standard here in the basketball team and as well as any athletics teams are um, to keep a certain GPA and to do well in school and to promote your team outside of the court and in the classroom. Chloe Idoni's experience on the court has also inspired the students in her classroom. I love being able to get to know all the kiddos in the classrooms that I've been into and they come and watch our games and it's just amazing to see that. So being able to support them and having them come support us in exchange is, is, is really amazing. Hockey has been a huge, huge part of my life. Like I, I learned how to skate when I was three. People say I was born with skates on, which is fair, because I you can find me on the ice any time of the day. I've always felt a connection with here because I was close to my grandpa when I was a baby, like he brought me here. I love Sean Sneed. He's the kind of, you know, student here at Ferris that wants to get involved. Once they're involved, they really want to help out. That grew into director of hockey operations for the past two years with our D1 hockey team here, and that has been just nothing but just special to me. Coach Tia Brando has led the Ferris volleyball team to countless victories since 1996. 28 years of building lasting relationships with her players. I think the pride for me is you watch them out on the court and you watch them interact with a teammate. And you're just so proud of them and how much they've grown. Volleyball's 2023 GLIAC championship win shows they continue to be a force to be reckoned with. And in May 2024, the team traveled to Spain and Portugal to put their skills to the test and experience team bonding across the ocean. In 2018, the men's basketball team won the D2 National Championship. National champions! The Bulldogs win the national championship! Ferris State with the win!
And in 2024, both the men's and women's basketball teams won the NCAA Midwest Region Championship and both advanced to the Elite Eight. The women's team advanced to the Final Four. Men's golf and tennis teams won GLIAC championships during the 23-24 academic year. This is all on top of the back-to-back -back national championships for the Ferris State football team. Being a part of that legacy is, it's huge. You know, we got two national championships and no one can take that from me. And being able to have my name attached to that, it's huge. My family can look back for generations to see what I did during my college athletic career. And it's, it's a blessing and I'm proud of it. A lot of times where we're building on momentum, we beat the number one team in the nation three times this year and that's never been done in Ferris State women's basketball history. But overall, it was an amazing experience. These varsity wins put Ferris on the map for athletics. And with over 30 club sports at Ferris, any student can participate. Like on the disc golf team, whose many successes include not only being four-time national champions, but also Benji Zorn's 2024 national championship singles win. Other clubs include the eSports team, who play competitive video games inside the Center for Virtual Learning's new custom-built eSports arena. Their Fortnite team just won first and second place in their Division I national tournament. We had 50 kids on Dean's List just this last semester. We have kids from every degree program on campus, and the one thing they have in common is that they love video games. Both men and women can compete. We don't care what your gender or what your abilities or any disabilities that you may have. You can still participate, you can still be on a team, and you're, you're equals with everyone else. So the, the playing field is extremely level for everyone, just how good you are at clicking a mouse. If you belong to clubs and you are engaged in the campus community, you're going to work hard, you're going to show up to class, you're going to see the value in it, and you're going to succeed more often. Through it all, players, coaches, students, and teachers all agree about the positive impact of Ferris athletics. I can say I was not the same person as I was my freshman year, and so um, going through all these experiences and having all these things that I've accomplished, um, it means a lot. It builds up my self-confidence. We're extremely proud of the players that that have come through here, graduated, and done terrific things. It's fun to be around sports, and, and obviously to see our, our student athletes uh, really experience success is, is a lot of fun. That uh, you know, It's kind of a driving force that keeps us all going. We're still a, a school of opportunity. That opportunity is something that our coaches, I think, take out into the field when they're recruiting, and they're looking for those student athletes that really fit that Ferris mold. I hope that Ferris keeps growing and, and that we become that in, in the Midwest or even a national leader. Anything you, you want to do, make sure you put your all into it. So when you look back, you have no regrets. The Ferris Pillar of Innovation weaves throughout all courses at Ferris, giving students a leg up on the competition. Ferris stays relevant by really building on that experiential learning and preparing the students to be able to hit the ground running. Applied learning is what distinguishes us as an institution. Our faculty working with students to prepare them for workforce challenges that make our students much more employable. Currently, Ferris offers more than 190 programs, from illustration to manufacturing engineering technology to pharmacy, one of Ferris's first programs. It started in 1893, when a pharmacy worker approached Mr. Ferris to learn more about the profession. Now, you know, we have over seven to 8,000 living alumni uh, across the country, really around the world. The innovative research being done in pharmacy has been recognized with nearly $4 million in grant funding over the last five years. Dr. Sonali Kirup weaves research throughout her courses and gives her students a hands-on opportunity to innovate. You can't do research alone, uh, but I would still say that they're more, it's mentored research, um, so it is collaborative, we work together. There is, you know, they hand off stuff, uh, some compounds to me, and then I hand it back to them. So there is a lot of handing off between the two of us. In 2023, Dr. Kirup's research into inhibitors for multi-resistant cancers was awarded a patent 
one of four within the College of Pharmacy. But the work doesn't stop there. So I'm in a, in a very vibrant group of people. Um, and so I'm, hope, I'm hopeful, you know, with the, with the people I'm working with, I should be able to take it forward. The first year is basically just finding out what sort of molecules we want to build. And then the second year, we'll be testing those molecules out and seeing how, how good they are. And then the third year is kind of finalizing up everything and getting ready to kind of publish what we've learned. So in a sense, we're discovering medications but we know we're also building the next generation of researchers as well. That focus on research during the COVID-19 pandemic gave students a unique opportunity to put their learning into practice by administering over 20,000 tests at the university. I got hired and I was pretty much um, the background person doing all of the inventory, keeping the clinic running and able to do what it's doing. But I also did all of the testing for those vaccination clinics as well. She did a ton of work with that. And that was very, very fun. And to watch a student blossom like that is, it's, there's nothing better than that. And Brian Pahoka, with faculty in plastics and product design, along with Ferris graduate Kevin Leeser from Operation Face Shield, manufactured and distributed nationally over 50,000 face shields for frontline workers. Dr. Sky Pike and biotechnology students in the Shimatsu Core Lab reinforced the Ferris approach to applied learning by using innovative wastewater testing to prevent outbreaks on campus. It's good PR for Ferris State University to be part of this project, to be known as someone who's part of breaking edge science. For this spirit of innovation to thrive across campus, faculty must keep their curriculum relevant to industry trends. Relevant at a level that people look at us and ask the question, whenever there's something that needs to be done, whenever there's something that's going on, I always want people to ask the question, what does Ferris State think about that? Students in the Michigan College of Optometry, the first optometry program in Michigan, get practical experience working with patients. It is currently the only fully accredited optometry program in the state. PGA Golf Management was another first in the nation when it began nearly 50 years ago and is currently fully endorsed by the Professional Golfers Association. We have 2,000 golf pros around the world that have come out of our program. In 2024, the Criminal Justice Program celebrates 50 years of preparing students for successful careers. The Law Enforcement Academy has graduated over 1,700 students since its founding. With the exponential growth of electric vehicles on the road, automotive and heavy equipment professors are integrating advanced technologies into the classroom, future-proofing our students' skill set. And that work will continue into the future thanks to a $350,000 grant from the National Science Foundation. In digital media software engineering, advancements in autonomous vehicles are driving curriculum with the creation of a new graduate certificate. <laughs> with the growth of AI, students in artificial intelligence are investigating how the ever-evolving technology can be used effectively across a host of applications. AI is the future, and we prepare students by exposing them to AI, how to manage AI, and how to implement it best in the workplace. The areas that we're focused on in artificial intelligence would be leveraging AI in cybersecurity, uh, but also in things like healthcare and a variety of business type applications. Ferris is the only university to have its own purpose-built double Faraday laboratory, which gives information security and intelligence students a unique opportunity to analyze malware and conduct forensic investigations. The goal for students coming out of the program is to be able to actionably and ethically address cybersecurity issues and adapt because the cybersecurity issues change uh, day to day. Programs like biology reinforce the importance of getting students out of the traditional classroom and into the field by investigating ecological changes. Yeah. So these, this is a beautiful example of a big wetland fern. Two, one, action. Students in digital animation and game design and television and digital media production also interact on location. Flight on set. 
with real-world innovative technologies like virtual production. Over decades, there have been hundreds of similar stories of innovative work seen across campus, all furthering the Ferris Founders' mission to provide hands-on education to anyone willing to learn. And then I'll go to the final project one more time, see if there's any questions, and I'll give you some time to work on that. Furthering Ferris's legacy of opportunity requires programs that reach all students regardless of their previous experience with education. For first-generation students, they might lack the resources to prepare for the traditional college experience. Our definition is, is a student who comes from a family where neither parent have a bachelor's degree or any student who has minimal prior exposure to the higher education system. As a first-gen graduate himself, Dr. Dave McCall knows the work it takes to be successful. First-gen students are also great problem solvers. They've really got to where they are a lot of times on their own, figuring things out. They're very resilient. They're very hardworking. Kelsey Myers, a senior in the television and digital media production program, knows all too well the challenges of being a first-generation student. It was hard because I didn't necessarily have the guidance um, in the beginning of my college career, but to be able to step out of my comfort zone and just put myself in an uncomfortable situation and learn from that made me more independent and made me more knowledgeable of the real world. Just because a family hasn't gone through college does not mean that they're not supportive. They just may not be able to answer the specific questions about FAFSA or you know what does this mean in higher education or what does this look like. The First Gen program provides a community of support to help students navigate the more complex workings of a university, including registration, locating classes, and understanding the inner workings of college life. Ultimately, this work helps to improve the lives of every student on campus. If you do everything through the lens of a first-gen student, you're really doing what's best for all students. For Kelsey, who's finishing up her internship, the hard work of navigating university life has paid off. I am very thankful that I have my education at Ferris because just the community and the support that I've gotten with my professors and with other coworkers and friends that I've had through Ferris has just been so amazing. The Ferris State mission of Education for All continues with the university's collaboration with the Ready for Life Academy. Ready for Life is an organization that promotes inclusiveness for everybody. Our uh, students have uh, intellectual and developmental challenges and it's hard to fit in everywhere. Looking at Ferris's philosophy, education is for everyone, that fits right in with us. Okay, perfect. For Sujay Coley, it's a chance to explore what he loves while also getting the experience of college life. Photography is my, fa my favorite passion in my life because I want to get into photography and journalism. Sujay, you know, what a neat guy. He um, is finishing his second year, excited about being a junior next year, um, has grown so much and has learned so much. Sujay is excited to have a support system that helps him thrive in and out of the classroom. I got some teachers and supporters there to help me be successful. Ferris is internationally recognized for its unique selection of hands-on programs, and the university continues to bring students to campus from around the world. It's pretty neat to be in that environment where you have so many cultures and so many opportunities of idea sharing and that worldview that international students not bring not only into the classroom but onto our campus and out into the community, out into our state, and out into our country as well. 
International students learn a lot from the Big Rapids community and also teach American students about the value of diverse perspectives. As we are providing those opportunities for international students, we're also providing opportunities for all of campus to be able to learn from these students and learn their worldview and how they do things at home and how their classrooms are ran back in their home country. I really like the people, like the friends I have here uh, in the community too. I have never had any like this great bonding I have. It's like you just feel like a number. You just feel lost. That's a and that's a common thing when it's with big universities. But with Ferris, it's like you don't feel uh, lost. You you know people, and even the professors they know you because it's a small size class, and, and just you, you feel good like accepted in the community. Graduate. And for the thirty fourth year. This learning culminates with the International Festival of Cultures, where international students share their food, culture, and performances from their home country. I was so trapped in my small city, and coming here just, just like new, new ways, new ways open, open for me. All the experiences, all the friends I made here, all the work I learned here, I would take, I would take all of that back when I go back. My grandparents actually had Ferris for a teacher. So I am a third generation uh, Ferris graduate and we have had something like 35 Ferris graduates in my family. So uh, there, there's a, a bit of a personal nature in terms of developing these programs to carry, carry on that tradition. This school was founded in 1884. And look at the vision that he had. I mean, that wasn't the norm back then. Education for all, regardless of race or gender, he was way ahead of his time, and um, uh, I wish he was here today. Because of Ferris's understanding of education and his passion um, to create a space where anybody can learn, I think that I was able to find what I loved. I want 140 years from now the same thing that I want a year from now, which is that we continue trying to be a better version of the institution that our founder created. Ferris is probably the best kept secret in the state of Michigan. It's just a great school. But I tell people without hesitation that everything I've been able to achieve is because I learned how to learn. I learned how to teach. I learned how to study. And I learned how to work as a group. And I learned that all here. People don't want to just kind of come and go during their college years and, and move on in life. They, they want to feel like they made the right choice, went to the right place, and are proud to be an alumni of that place. And I think the legacy of the growth of the school has really helped that happen on a national scale. It is more than just simply a, a field of study. Those students leave, they graduate here, and go out and truly help sometimes save lives. A student succeeding is Ferris's success. When they come across the stage, that to me is, I mean, that's their moment. I like to tell students to drink in that moment, to take a, a couple of seconds just to kind of pause and think about the magnitude of the moment. I remember passing the water tower that says you'll love it here, and I was like, I already do. Juliana DiNicolo. It's been a riot, so I'll never forget the experiences that I've had. Cody William Langley. I probably will cry. I definitely will cry. Because my mom's going to cry, and then I'm going to cry. Kelsey Marie Myers. <laughs> I will always have a special place in my heart for Ferris. Ola Larry, Ola Depot. My dream here at Ferris was for one to graduate, and I did that, cum laude. <laughs> Shout out to my mom, she was very happy for that. 
I feel proud and I feel an amazing feeling, just all that hard work finally being paid off. Chloe Idoni. I get to hand my grandson his diploma. So I'm excited. I told him if he sees some tears, I'm okay. When I see him, I'm just going to hug him because I hope he knows this is because of him and I came here because of um, everything he did. I just hope he's proud of me when I finish my diploma finally. Sean Sneed. Ferris will always hold a special place in my heart and I always view it as home. So I invite all the graduates of the class of 2024 at this time to flip your tassels. And always remember, you have home right here at Ferris State University. Make a difference in the world and make it a personal mission to make the world a better place. The Bulldog can be found most often at Ferris athletic events. He attends all home football, hockey, and basketball games. This year, he began attending volleyball games and managed to make a few wrestling meets as well. Like Wilzak, this Bulldog is keeping his identity a secret. No one, with the exception of a few close friends, knows who he is. He likes it that way, and both he and Davenport protect his anonymity strongly. Well, both of the Bulldogs felt the same way, and I guess we have to agree it's worked out that way, that, that they can do more and, uh, and uh, get away with things if people don't know who they are. On September 25th, the most visible and permanent addition to the campus was dedicated in the form of a statue of Woodbridge Ferris. The statue stands between Vandercook Hall and Star Auditorium and is a focal point for those visiting campus. The statue was built through a fundraising effort and the work was done by Avard Fairbanks of Salt Lake City. And if there's action around campus, it's likely the Ferris TV production crew will be there to capture it as part of their coursework. In varsity sports, there's plenty of action year-round, especially when the Bulldogs take on league rival Michigan State in NCAA Division I hockey. Small class sizes, one-to-one -one attention, and the knowledge and life experience of every instructor provides you with an environment for individual, personalized learning that is rivaled by few other public universities. 